guys, it's Lauren Yates from Rave It Up here. And today we're going to be having a chat with actor Chris Potter, who you may know playing Tim Fleming in the TV show Heartland. We have a chat about the new season of Heartland, as well as go back to chat about all the other projects he has done. Heaps of TV shows, heaps of movies, and how he came across acting. And also talk about a little snippet of his music career. There's so much to cover, so let's get into it now. Chris, welcome to Rave It Up. How are you going today? I am exceptional, I think. Exceptional. I mean, Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I, I, it's a brisk, uh, late winter day here in Ontario, Canada. I'm staring out at Lake Huron. There's ice on the water, partially. I can't. I, it's 53 miles across to Michigan from where I'm staring. So there are patches of ice. It's, it's absolutely b beautiful. Things are breaking up. The harshest part of winter is ending. And I can see some light at the end of this long winter tunnel that I've been yeah. in all <laughs> uh, the past four months. So. Yeah, we've just gotten out of our summer. So I'm kind of looking forward to a little bit of winter. But it is a pleasure to have you on the show as well, because as you probably already know, a lot of your Heartland co-stars have been on, like Amber and Graham, Michelle, Sean, Jessica and Kerry. It was about time we had you on too, right? So we can get to talk about I Heartland. I had no idea. <laughs> Have, they've all been on your show? Yes. Oh, they haven't mentioned it. They loved it. Graham's been on twice now. He was on just two weeks ago for the second time. <laughs> well, I don't actually ever speak to anybody, <laughs> so <laughs> I wouldn't know. I live on another side of the country from uh, all of my Heartlanders, so I really don't stay in touch that close, closely with everybody, but um, I'll see them again in May. Yes, then you can chat about it. Have a big laugh. <laughs> now, since this is your first time on the show, Chris, we'd actually love to get to know you a little bit better and start from the beginning of your whole journey, if that's okay, to get a good idea of how you made it to where you are today. So I did have a read of your biography, and as be before we started recording, you're like, some of it is incorrect, but we'll see. We'll see where we go. So your dad is a former football player and an insurance salesman, and your mum was a singer. And I did read that you wanted to be an actual professional athlete. What happened to that dream? Or were you a bit too worried about injury well, that could end your career? <laughs> well, first of all, my father uh, was drafted in, into the CFL. That's the Canadian Professional Football League, which is American football. Um, and he was an insurance executive. He wasn't a, an insurance salesman. He had a staff of about 75 agents. He was one of the first men to run an agency that hired women agencies, a, a, agents. Anyway, so I, by the time I was born, my father was really more of a coach. He was coaching the university team and his playing days were over. So in, in correcting that, yes, I suppose he was at one time in his youth a uh, pro ball player, but the dad I knew was a coach and um, a businessman. And my mother, in her youth, was a singer. That's correct. And is probably where my brother and sister and I developed our love of music and, and uh, performing because my mother did a lot of amateur theater when we were growing up and got us involved. But my mom was an exceptional singer and award-winning. Uh, but the mother I grew up with was a lawyer and a judge. And um, so... I grew up with two professional parents, really. Yeah, very different. Uh, which is which is a little different than an athlete, than a football player and a singer. That's that's the only correction. We had a house that was um, full of sports and full of music, and um, in that environment, I really took to music as a child, and and I picked up instruments quickly. Um, and I, I, I suppose that that my, yeah, my humble beginnings or interests uh, were from childhood and my involvement in amateur theater and um, the school shows, of course, and things like that. And then uh, I loved music and I loved rock and roll as a boy. So I took, um, it took a lot of time rehearsing and forming a band in, in my high school days that performed in the bars 
and um, traveled in the summers when, when we could. And then I uh, c continued through that into when I, my university years, when I should have been going to university. So I had, I was one of those guys that had a band that was very popular out of high school. So we ended up all taking a gap year from our first year of university and traveling on the road. And then we took another year and then half the guys went back and I'm still on my gap year. <laughs> I haven't gone back. So, so no. And uh, therefore that left me with a rather um, limited group of choices when it came to careers. I, Mm. Uh, you know, there's one thing that you've got to love about youth. If you're confident and you're engaged and you, you're passionate about something, um, I suppose at the time I wasn't too worried about the consequences of not having an education or a degree of any sort. But I did definitely come out of an environment where that was encouraged and um, frowned upon, in fact, uh, if if you didn't have a post-secondary school education, people just thought, well, what on earth, how will you survive? What on earth will you do in this world? Because I was surrounded by a lot of, of academics in my, in, in my parents, friends, and families. Mm. So throwing that caution to the wind, I, I pursued it. And I pursued music and theater. When I say theater, I did amateur theater. Yeah. And I was involved in an amateur theater company and I did play after play after play with this group of people who uh, often, have you, have you ever seen the movie Waiting for Guffman? It's no, I haven't. Um, well, amateur theater tends to be usually uh, full of people who have other occupations in the community. Mm. You, may, you may be starring in a play with the dentist local dentist and a cop or other people who have a passion you know it's community theater mm. and um i did a lot of really bad plays for many years with a fun group of people <laughs> um and i played a lot of average rock music at a lot of tough bars really loudly um with a bunch of wannabe rockers uh, and yet all of it somehow culminated into my uh, my memories and some sort of training ground for me uh, that evolved into a professional career in, in, as an actor. Mm. Really never saw acting coming as, as my first as my first love. I, I, I think yeah. uh, even I was skeptical about whether or not there was a future in that here in Canada. Mm. Um, we weren't like really coffee. famous. Yeah, well, we weren't really well known for our um, high output of world class movies or at the time television. Mm. And um, there wasn't much of a path. Um, I'm going to turn 60 this year. I was born in 60. So um, we're talking about the 70s in Canada, my formative years. And um, there really was not an outlet uh, for for someone like me. Um, and so it, it wasn't until I was 28 years old working for my father's insurance office and one of his uh, agents that um, I was discovered in a play. Uh, and it was a Neil Simon play called Biloxi Blues. And um, I was cast in the play and, and was told that it, this was professional theater and that it would be required that I rehearse with the company from nine to five every day. And the, the director said, I'm aware of, uh, I'm aware that you have um, a full-time job. Can you get the time off? And I said, sure, I can take some time off. I was a salesman, so I had my own hours, but probably wasn't prudent my success as a salesman to take a couple weeks off, but I did. And um, when I returned back from the rehearsals, because it was a play about the army and about young army recruits, um, I had shaved my head and I had 
had two gold teeth put on my uh, front two teeth here uh-huh. by a local dentist, like clip on. And I had tattoos, my arms tattooed. Wow. With, with stencils, not real tattoos. Back then, actually, uh, that would have been uh, 1988. Um, no one had tattoos. The only people that had tattoos were convicts or guys that had been in the Navy. Mm. Tattoos were not all that popular at that time, you know. So I had to really search around for a tattoo parlor, find the stencils, get them put on. But I fully committed and got back to the office. And it just so happened that day that the local paper had done an article on me joining the professional stage that, that local boy will be starring in this. Um, play and my father came into my office with the front page <laughs> I, I wish I I should have I've got that somewhere but anyway <laughs> it was called the London Free Press and my father said uh, what is this he says Chris Potter used to sell insurance now he sells himself local actor hits the big stage signs contract for television series with CBC, blah, blah, blah. He said, you have a full-time job. I said, oh, yeah, Dad, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. <laughs> and he said, well, you, you can't wear two jackets. And I said, oh, I know. I realized that. He said, you just got married. You have a baby. You have a house. You're going to leave your career for this? And I said, I, I uh, he said, and what is this TV series? I said, well, it's called um, Material World. It's, um, it's for the CBC and it's a comedy. And we shoot in front of a live audience. And, and you and mom can come and watch when we film it. And he said, yeah, well, we'll see about that. He said, what do they, what do they pay you for this sort of thing? And I said, well, this is 1988. I said, $5,000. And he said, well, how long does it take to do a show and I said well it's one show a week for 13 weeks so it's going to take about 13 weeks to film it and he said you're going to quit your career for a job uh he said you're going to quit your career for a job for five thousand dollars for 13 weeks work and I said no dad that's a week that's per week and he said oh Wow. Oh, well, he said, well, you know, you could try it. And if it doesn't work out, you can always get your desk back. <laughs> so he approved then. I, did, I did try it. And I've never looked back from that day forward. And in fact, I, I am so grateful because I ended up with four children yeah. and uh, the same wife. And uh, I've worked for 30 years straight without a break on a television screen. Yeah. Uh, which has been, I think, seven seven TV series and in between some other stuff. You know, yeah, movies I guess appearances and movies. But primarily television, I think it's, so, I don't know, I think I, I've averaged about 20 episodes a year of one hour television for 30 straight years here in this uh, country and in the U.S. Um, so my father ended up becoming my greatest fan, actually. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, and at times when I wanted to, when the business, it, it, I, I might be making this sound like, it was, like it's been easy. Uh, it has been 30 years of straight work, but like, as any actor, artist can tell you that there are... Uh, probably five disappointments for every bit of good news that you probably that you more. Get. Po- possibly more and um the job itself uh, is getting used to uh dealing with rejection mm. because rejection the rejection can be personal <laughs> um i was used to rejection <laughs> especially after having sold insurance for several years but uh so to me, it was auditions were a numbers game. Mm. But as far as the um, the personal rejection, that 
it takes as a young person uh, it takes some time to get used to because you're the product so yeah. when they say no they're not saying no to the product you're selling they're saying no to you and <laughs> it's hard not to take that personally so mm. i think that's some good i think that's some advice for all up and coming the young artists is that um try not to take that part of it too seriously it's a very subjective business well yeah as i've learned you know a lot of the auditions the people casting have what they want in mind and it could just be that you're like two centimeters too short or you got the wrong hair color or you know i've heard definitely heaps of stories about that well i can tell you that as a, a director I, i'm i'm find myself having to be involved in casting and and you're you're very right it it it's often just um it, it's sort of a chemistry thing like if you've already got your leading lady as an example and uh she is a certain height and a certain uh type col- uh, hair color whatever whatever the, your leading lady is you're looking for a leading man often that has some sort of and that can rule out two or three other fantastic candidates yeah who just happen to be either too big or slightly too small or, you know because you've got a selection that's what casting's all about but what's well, tough on all the people that came second and third so mm. you just got to keep Some pulling up your bootstraps mm. And don't give up. That's like my biggest advice for all up and coming people. Because even though you do get that rejection along the way, all you just need is one one person to say yes. Yeah, I give up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then get back into it. <laughs> yeah, give up and you know try to find a way to get to get back up. Mm. And um, but the wanting to give up feeling never ends I, i'd be suspect of anybody who didn't wasn't crushed along the way on a regular basis but uh, yeah. you know you have to look at the career over uh, many many years not over just what how your how this year was yeah. hell this year's been terrible for everybody in the for world. everybody so, yep <laughs> you know. so, do you ever regret not going down like the sports career path or you, you're loving what you're doing every no day? i I absolutely loved sports and I was I must say I was really successful in sports at a very young age so it came naturally to me and easily and uh I found myself in the company of a lot of athletes who went on to professional sports so I have friends I was thinking about that the other day because I grew up with a lot of sets of brothers families that had at least one you know at least two boys or at least five boys in the family and up here we played hockey my brother and i both played um competitive hockey all the way up to junior hockey we had other buddies who both brothers ended up very close friends who ended up playing pro hockey and we all grew up together and played together and nobody ever really talked about one day I'm going to play pro hockey. I just didn't grow up. I, it's just what we did. We And we all played football and we all played baseball. That was my group. And I loved sports and I found it easy to succeed at sports. Mm. But I never once, I don't know what I was thinking as a kid. I, 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 I never thought of it. Actually, the one thing I remember that I wanted to be was a DJ. A DJ. Oh, that's different. Yeah. <laughs> Different than I, your I rock musician. A, we had a uh, we had a friend in the neighborhood who was the local DJ. Um, his name was Bill Brady, and he was a brilliant guy. And he did the morning show, and I grew up listening to him every morning. And I knew him, and I I always admired him. He became a real champion of mine, actually, as an adult, and uh, Bill's still around. And I. I've got to thank him for for that motivation. But I always thought being a DJ on the radio would have been a great career. Mm, definitely. I tried that once, by the way. Oh, did you? Cool. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did a I did a morning show with a woman who named uh, Aaron. So it was Aaron and CP in the morning. And thank God I had her uh, helping me because she was so good, and I learned some lessons quickly on that um, on that show. She said to me the first day, you know, we can 
play any music we want. We have to play certain program songs, but in between, in the morning, we can play what we want. And we can talk about whatever we want. So, you know, I'm not sure the demograph demographic of your audience, so I may not want to tell the story, but... Uh, tell so it, I, I can edit it out if, if it's not. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I don't think I will. Um, but <laughs> put it this way: at the end of the, at the end of my first morning show, she said she had cut me off at one point. She was going, "No, no, no, no! You can't say that." And she, at the end of it, she said, "We need a safe word." She said, um, uh, "She said our safe word is pineapple. When I say pineapple, you have to shut up." <laughs> and then let her take so, over. <laughs> uh, so the next day, I. The next uh, day that I came in for the show, there was a poster in the studio of my face with pineapples all around it. She'd cut out, put around. Moral of, the moral of that story is I found that really challenging because we had to do the news, weather, and sports on the half hour. Mm. And then we had to, and I learned a lot about an audience, a, a radio audience. I came in always with what I thought were sophisticated ideas about topics that people would want to know about, like sous vide cooking. I remember that when I kind of researched it. And she, I said, what are you going to talk about today? And she said, I'm going to talk about the new beer fridge down at the liquor store. <laughs> and I thought, oh, petty. <laughs> you know, let me, well, I spoke about sous vide cooking. She spoke about the new beer fridge and she looked over at me about a half an hour later and she said oh we've got a lot of hits on facebook they're really responding she said all about the beer fridge no oh, she Every won <laughs> <laughs> she said there was like 200 people that called in and on, written in on facebook commenting on the, that beer fridge Rich? and no one about my sous vide cooking so i thought oh man Keep it simple, Chris. You know, uh, people just want to get up in the morning and get to their kid to school. You know. How long did that last for you? I, I did that about, I'm going to say seven years ago. Yeah. Like not, not very long ago. It was a small country radio station. And, um, and were you there for a year had, or you didn't even make the year? <laughs> yeah, no, I was there for a year. Yeah, yeah. I was there for the whole, the whole season. Let's call it not a full year. I, I did it for my whole time off that I had uh, in hiatus. And um, so it was about, I don't know, let's just say six months, of, yeah, half a year, I guess. And it was harder than but you it thought. Was, <laughs> it was difficult. It, it became a grind. Like I'd have to get up really early and get down there. And then I'd, after a while, I started really not enjoying it. Mm. But, uh, you know, it's tough. It's tougher than it looks. Well, you never have to wonder what if now. You've done it. Not your, not your scene. <laughs> That's why I don't do any social media podcasts, anything. I, I think you're the first person I've done one of these with. Oh, um, I'm honored. I've done radio interviews and I've done a lot of um, Zoom, uh, whatever, sessions Meetings, yeah. for the X, well, for the X-Men. Um, because I was the original voice, the only voice of Gambit. Gambit, yeah, yeah. There's been a resurgence in the X-Men, um, original the original cast of the animated series for Fox, which was very popular in the nineties, apparently. I didn't know. And um, so they put the band back together and they've got all the people who did the original voices of Gambit and uh, uh, Wolverine and Rogue and Storm and all. That's cool. Uh, Beast. Yeah, and we, it's been hugely popular. So we were sort of traveling around as a group doing um, festival um, comic cons and things mm. like that and i said that was cool because i didn't have to really it wasn't me yeah it was just it was gambit gambit <laughs> so um, um outside of that i really don't like to talk a lot because my kids say dad you know that's just a recipe for disaster you and twitter and or you and instagram or you and facebook please don't so i took their advice years ago and I have stayed away from that. Have they not taught you? Well, the thing is, there's not much to teach me. I just don't need to be, 
I have no desire. I have really nothing to share with people. Uh, you know, well, I beg to do for you. You've been telling really great stories today. Well, I, I, but I mean, I don't need to weigh in every day on politics or on my, my feelings about something. I, I'm an actor. And, um, you know, I don't mind talking about the character I play, but I just, I don't need to. I don't care about how many followers. I I, I can't even imagine that, actually. Right? <laughs> <laughs> have a lot, but I know all the fans appreciate you coming on on my show today to even have a chat to us, so I can hear your side of the story about everything and hear your hear your life. <laughs> yeah, I had a question life. about the X Men too. You know, being doing a voice for an animated series, how is that whole process for you? Is that like a totally different sort of acting? Yeah, I did a Cajun patois. You talk very low. We talk like this, you know. I, I can't. Even, I don't know if I can even do it still. <laughs> it was thirty years ago. And um, but if you listen to the cartoons, what we did back then is they they were. I thought they were smart in their casting with Fox because they ended up hiring a lot of theater actors, and they brought some people to that talent pool who had had a lot of experience fleshing out a character really gave some thought to, I know they were professionals and mm. but they weren't straight up voice actors who could do a, a ton of different voices like Mel Blanc or someone who did a lot of the Warner Brothers cartoons could mm. do you know, dozens of different variations with his voice and this was more about playing a character what was funny about it was that we the first year we did it all in, together in the studio, like a loop group. And we ended up having a lot of mic spill and we'd be laughing our heads off because we did have a lot of funny people in the group. And um, so they eventually got wise to that and separated us all and we would do it on our own time. And um, my, yeah, my accent was, uh, the Cajun Patois. He Gambit is from New Orleans, and so it's a mixture of southern, the southern Louis, the south, southern Louisiana the slang, mm. um, sort of a, a a southern drawl mixed with a French Canadian accent, and that that's the easiest way I can explain it. You get a hybrid. It's it's Cajun, mm. and it's a Cajun. Cajun Patois uh, has a specific sound and a specific um, specific words to it, to the language, because occasionally a French word pops up in the in the dialogue, like the word share, um, which is, you know, things are going to be all right now, share. And, and share is when you're talking to a young woman. And so I, I uh, somehow I... Uh, knew enough about how to do that mm. it, and we did it for five years so anyway that's the other zoom call that i've i've done big chunk of your life i feel like i can just talk to you all day just about all the stuff you've done and all the other jobs well, and... i was I, I was doing that show at the same time but my biggest break was actually with kung fu with david carradine for warner brothers mm. and um that's kind of an interesting story but i i did sh I did shoot Kung Fu, uh, which was all, you know, based on the original series of the 70s about the Kwai Chang Kane, Kane, uh, Kwai Chang Kane the Shaolin priest who walked the earth. And um, I played his son in the Kung Fu, The Legend Continues. And I got to work with the great David Carradine. And it was at the same time that I was doing the X-Men series. And then in the final... After the final season of Kung Fu, I went straight on to a show called Silk Stockings. So that was a very busy period of my life. Um, yeah. And we had three girls at the time and a boy on the way. Oh. So looking back, it was quite a blur, the 90s and early 2000s. Um, but the story of the... Of, getting that first break was kind of interesting because um, originally they had flown me down to uh, LA from Canada to test to screen test for a new series called Baby Talk 
which was based on the, a movie called Look Who's Talking with John Travolta and Kirstie Alley. And they were going to remake that as a television series. And when you do a screen test, you test to get opposite another actor. And mm. usually the two of you sign a contract just before you go in to see if you can get the job. And when you go in in L.A. to do that, you test in a... We were on the set of uh, Who's the Boss? It was a Tony Danza hit show. And we, we tested on that. And all the executives were sitting up in the audience in the dark. And they're on the stage. And you've just signed this big, fat contract. And that's all you can think about, you know, <laughs> just before you step on the stage. And uh, the, I met the other guy, and the guy said to me, well, man, I've done a bunch of these tests. He said, you know how it's going to work out while I'm going to get the job, the other guy. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking, well, I hope I get it. No offense. But um, I tested, and I went back to uh, the hotel, and, and that they were putting me up in and no cell phones back then this was 1990 and uh around i think 90 91 some right in there somewhere but uh they my light was flashing on my phone and my agent in la said to me he said uh, i've got an audition for you and they want you to meet at warner brothers in about an hour and i said okay what for what and he said, for the new Kung Fu series. And I said, you mean like the old one, like with David Carradine? And my agent said, yeah, yeah, that's, they're remaking it. And I said, with, with him? <laughs> yeah, he's going to play the grandson of his original character. And I said, well, where's he been for 20 years? And he said, well, don't, don't worry, he doesn't drink anymore. And I'm like, what? Okay. So he ended up... Um, I ended up going and meeting with them. Make a long story short, I said, what happened to the, I, what about the other job? The one I came down for, the one I tested for. He said, oh, the, the other guy got it. I said, no. what? I said, you're kidding. I said, who was that guy? I said, he was really nice. I said, he told me he's done a bunch of these. He said, yeah, his name's George Clooney. He's been kicking what? around town for, he said, he's been kicking around town for a few years. He's done a bunch of pilots. He said, don't worry about it. You got to meet with Warner Brothers in, you know, in an hour. So, the moral of this story is... Is that you met George Clooney? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> is, that, is that I met George. But I, I also, uh, at that time, it became clear to me that, that my path... Well, at the time, I, could t I, I would imagine that George Clooney would say the same thing. He didn't know what his path would be. He, he, I've heard him say that it wasn't until... ER launched that you know his career took off. Well, at the time, I I was from Canada. I I was there to get that job. That's very naive of me. I wasn't. I couldn't stay. I had to fly back to Canada because I was married with a baby and a house. Mm. And my life, I couldn't stay and continue to audition in LA and try. So I needed to get a job either that day or the next day, or else nothing was going to happen. So I, the next day, I got the kung fu job, mm -hmm. and um, and. Yeah, fortunately, because I, I, I didn't come home empty handed and uh, things, you know, things progressed from there. My career followed its its own trajectory of sorts. And uh, here I am today. So my you children take a break and there, Chris, <laughs> <laughs> so much work, <laughs> my wife and my my wife, Karen, and my uh, my grown children have grown up with uh, this business mm. you know, which is in good. these 30 in these 30 years and um they've seen the benefits of it but they've they've also seen the challenges of it so um mm. and not <laughs> and i'm not sure you know, none of them are in it so i i guess that begs the question <laughs> how do they really <laughs> feel about it you've but, turned them uh, off it <laughs> You know, they understand how hard you work, and that's good that they've been there from day dot, especially your wife. It's beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome.
Now, a lot of people listening today obviously know you as Tim Fleming on the TV show Heartland, and they're big fans of the show. So I think we should chat about it because that's what they're probably listening for. But I want to bring you actually back to the beginning of your journey with the show. How did you originally come across Heartland and did you automatically connect with the character of Tim? Because it is funny when I was interviewing Sean Johnston, he even said he went for the character of Tim and I was like, nah, I can't see you as a Tim. Chris is a Tim. <laughs> okay, well, here's a couple things. My only brother, who's two years younger than me, uh, is named Tim. Oh, that's so. Funny. My whole life, I've been called. I've been called Tim, and it's just ironic that I'd end up playing Tim all these years. Um, second of all, I had just come off of a TV series that I absolutely loved doing called Wild Card with Jolie Fisher. And it was a drama comedy about two private um, insurance investigators who wouldn't admit that they were in love with each other. And we investigated, you know, it was a, one of those types of That shows, sounds cool. But, I want to watch it. <laughs> you know, and, and it was fun and funny and I really loved doing it. But I thought the show was going to run for years and it ran for two. And um, I was really disappointed about that because it had legs, but... Again, in this business, uh, the strangest things can happen. And in, in the case of that show, the, the president of the network died of cancer oh, no. uh, that year. And he was the real champion of, of the show. And the writers uh, were a male, female, uh, husband and wife writing team who had a great track record. And they had, they quit. And we had to sustain the loss of these people and uh it was that magic combination of writing that, that made that show work so i basically i'm unemployed at, at, for, for that right after that for the first time in my career um i really wasn't sure what i was going to do and at the same time the writer's strike hit and reality television in 2007 had become the new popular program because it was the crack co cocaine of programming. It allowed the networks to make stuff that they could make for cheap and get on the air and it had a quick hit. Mm. Um, moral of the story was there was not a lot of work for scripted television. Actors were panicking, writers were panicking. This is 2007 and CBC came along with this pilot they, they were going to do called Heartland. And I was approached and I read it and the very first read, I said to my wife, this thing can be a hit. I said, this is the exact kind of show that I've been waiting to watch with our kids because I fall asleep every show that they watch. <laughs> There's nothing that keeps me awake other than SpongeBob. And, you know, they were at that age, right at the right heartland demographic. They were, they were all teenagers and younger. So I thought, you know, I think they do this well this thing could last and maybe i should wade into this mm. and they had made me um an offer to do the ca a cameo appearance in the in the pilot where tim comes back to um his wife's ex-wife's funeral amy and lou's mother mm. and um i agreed to do that and then some time passed between that pilot being picked up for series or not. And in that time, um, they had made an offer and I, it was, it was not a good offer, not to me anyway, because I was being advised not to do it. But my heart was telling me, geez, it's too bad because I, I think this could be good. Mm. But the, you know, the commerce gets in the way and you have a price and so on. And I, you know, you're taking advice from your manager agent and, and uh, so eventually I ended up having a brief meeting with the president of the CBC network at the time. It's, it's the National Broadcasting Network, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And um, basically it was just a meeting where he bullied me. He, he said, uh, what's your problem? You know, we want you on this show. We think it's going to be good. And I said, well, you know, this, this apparently this and that are in the way. And he said, well, we can eliminate those things. And I said, then I do it. He said, well, then you're going to do it. And oh, awesome. That's how it, ha that's how it happened for me. 
I didn't know much about it at all. I didn't know about the, the books. I didn't know the other actors at all. They were brand new. Mm -hmm. Sean was an experienced uh, actor who, who um, I hadn't even crossed paths with, actually, because we were on, from different parts of the country and kind of in different paths. And uh, yeah. the others were all brand new. They were kids. And um, I was coming in with a, a lot of experience at that point. I put in hours and hours, hundreds of hours on television sets at that point um, as an adult. So it was quite a change for me, too. I was used to carrying a load. And, and uh, I wasn't being asked to do that in Heartland. I was just being asked to hit my mark and say my lines. Mm -hmm. And um, that was okay. Uh, I signed up and I'm still there. And I've, I've found, you know, uh, I found a way to, to make it what something that I was interested in doing and wanting to do. Mm. Um, but initially it was a bit of a challenge for me trying to gear down and not being asked of much. And I, I don't think that's an uncommon situation in the, in, but am I ever glad that I stuck with it? And I'm very proud of it now. In fact, it's now going you know, into a, a 15th season. Yeah. Um, which is, as they say, it's the longest running Canadian series. It's, I really never saw this coming, but it's, it, you know, in my world, it's one of the greatest gigs you could have. Um, Definitely. Steady, long running work uh, in a business in a, with a job you love. Um, no complaints. Cool. And it, it has been uh, an absolutely beautiful experience working in the mountains and the foothills and environs of the Rockies and work with really talented, resilient uh, crew people and have made some lasting friendships with some of the members of our crew that I, that I do stay in touch with. Um, and I play a lot of golf and fish and things like that in the summer out there with them. And, um, it's become, you know, a way of life actually. Mm. But you, I think for the for the listeners, it's important to know that I don't live. <laughs> I mean, what is a what is a five hour plane ride from Sydney? What town is five hours by plane from Sydney? Ugh, that's where by I, plane, probably. Well, that's that's where I'm from. That's where I live. I'm five hour plane plane flight. So wow. I'm on the other side. I'm on the other side of the country from where we film. Mm. Um, and most of our cast live, you know, in the province on the other or, side, yeah. or within an hour's plane. plane. Mm. So it's been very difficult for uh, logistically. It's been a challenge because when we film Heartland, I have to, over the years, picked up and depending, my kids are all grown now. They're working women and my youngest is uh, in law school, but at, a, at when they were younger, ten years ago, uh, we had we had a lot of logistics to work out all the time to get out mm. and do the show uh, from such a distance. So that has been part of my experience. You know, it really has been a a challenge that way for for us all. It, so it's a bit of a family commitment yeah. we have to make. Dad, you know, Dad's doing Heartland again. It starts in May. What are we going to do? What's What's everybody doing this summer? Yeah. Where is everybody going to be? How can we meet out in Calgary? And will we get to see each other? And you know, that's well, we're glad you stuck with it. It's a good problem to have. But it is. Have, but it is to have work. <laughs> and did you already it, know it, how to ride horses, or did you have to learn for the show? Oh, uh, you know what? When I did my first series for Warner Brothers, I didn't know anything about martial arts and fighting and. And by the time I was done, I was awesome at <laughs> fighting on on camera, looking like I could fight because I'm an actor. Mm. And um, but I didn't know any more about martial arts than when I started. Really, I'm, I'm an actor. Same goes for Heartland. I I, I ride in every one of those um, shows 
that you see me on horseback. I also have a double who does anything at dangerous speed. Mm. But but we all ride on the show. But um, I've well, never look looked realistic. at it. That's what that's what matters. Well, but but you, you're seeing us riding. You just but you know it's film business, so we're not going to run. We're not going to put our actors, none of our actors, uh, on horseback and have them run flat out. Mm. That's just irresponsible and a huge risk insurance wise. Um, so, you know, everybody rides on the show and we all love horses. And if, if we didn't, when we started, we do now. Yeah. Uh, some people are scared of horses and, uh, some people aren't animal people. Mm. Um, you know, but I can tell you that it's been an incredibly calming uh, experience and, and wonderful to have that presence of the horses around. It just changes the dynamic on a set for some reason. They are they are creatures that speak to us um, and can can alter our behavior without ever just by their presence alone. Sounds like a very um, calming set. It it, it, it really is. Uh, it's pretty remarkable that way. So we've had we've had a really great run, and you know I'm not sure how you know I'm not sure how long we'll do it. You you just don't know these things in the business. Um, mm. But I know that the uh, it's the challenge that we had this year was sustaining the loss of Ty. Ty, yeah. And um, there were concerns. Yeah, did you and, think it was uh, going to affect the fans as much as it has? Well, I'd had some experience with it personally because while I was doing Heartland, every year I was doing a movie called a, a series of movies called The Good Witch. With, Which I um, love, by the way, love The Good Witch. Been watching the new well, series on Netflix. I kept, <laughs> Which I unfortunately, kept you know, movies. your character's no longer there, but. <laughs> Okay, so that was my story. So they killed my character off because when we went to series, uh, we weren't able to make a deal for me to make for me to do both series. And my allegiance was to Heartland at that point, and had just signed resigned my contract. So um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do both at the same time. But again, it was a five-hour flight difference from where they were filming, so that was challenging. And of course, uh, other things, but. Uh, for the first year of that, when they started the series, the fans of Good Witch freaked out over that over the loss. Well, that was my own personal little experience. That had didn't compare to the love of Ty. Yeah, the, over fourteen the, years. The, over fourteen years, but it's happened over and over again in television series. Mm. If an actor wants to leave, they leave, and you try to fill up the gap, the hole that's been made. And I do like um, how they've, you know, started to wean the fans off him, if that makes sense, so that, you know, he doesn't just die and, okay, say goodbye. They've actually done it really gradually, which is really beautiful so that we can say goodbye properly. Unlike I think the writers have, I think the writers have actually, um, the writing team and the leadership of Heather Conkey as the showrunner um, in this case, I, and, and that was the vibe on set, even behind the pandemic mask this year and all of the protocols we had to go through. We knew we had a daunting challenge to make these shows better um, as best we could make them to overcome the loss of this character. And and um, I think everyone rose to the challenge, but you're only as good as the writing. And, yes. um, you know, that's the other thing. I'm not Tim. I don't even like Tim. You know, I like <laughs> I like to play Tim. Tim is three different guys that I know. I'm not going to tell you who. And I love those guys, but I also can't stand them. And, <laughs> yep. and uh, does that make sense? <laughs> um, so that's kind of who I think of, what, you know, who I built Tim around. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, that keeps... It, that the writers have done a great job with each of the characters in sustaining and, and, and growing the, the, 
the characters for the actors and allowed us, uh, you know, we, we're all different that way. I never weigh in on the writing. I, I really respect what the writers go through. And as a director, I see how, how much of a jigsaw puzzle um, writing episodes of television can really be. Mm. It, it's miraculous to me. I really admire them. Um, so I, I don't, you know, have many discussions about where my character's headed. I often don't even ask at the beginning of the year, sort of leave it up to the it's a surprise for all of us. <laughs> One, <laughs> wonder where I'm going to be headed. Um, You've all done such a good job, you know. It must be very hard to, after 14 years of filming with Graham Wardle and having the character of Ty there to now not have him there. So not only the writing's been fantastic, but all of you in the cast, your acting has just been impeccable. Thank you. Right. Take thank the compliment. I, yeah, thank you very much. I was I wanted to talk to you because I knew you were from Sydney, but how what a fan I am of of some of these Australian shows that I've watched and that, or that my wife and I watched. Um, because now with all of the streaming, I'm getting shows that I just wouldn't have got a few years back, and even though some of them are old shows. Mm. Um, so there, the show Offspring with Asher Ketty. Yes. Uh, okay. I watched every single episode of that. I love those actors. I love Asher Ketty. <laughs> I'm a fan, fan boy. Um, love, love my way. That was, I actually watched after, um, Offspring for some reason, which I think, but I think love my way was on before mm. Offspring. And that's with uh, Claudia Carvin. Is that her name? Yes, the yeah, lead actress it. in that. Yeah, I love Claudia. And that episode number eight in that, where the, the little girl dies. And, oh my God, that was probably the greatest episode of television I've, I've ever seen. That was great. Uh, I love you. Check, love our Aussies. <laughs> you should check that. I no, will now. Austra Australia has amazing television, and I think far better than what we're putting out in Canada. Um, you know, we make a lot of American television in Canada for mm. Americans, uh, which is why I'm proud of Heartland because it is uh, uniquely Canadian for Canadians. And then it's been, you know, yeah. it's it spread out to the world, but uh, usually a couple seasons behind. And um, so I'm having the same experience with some of these Australian shows. This is Wentworth I loved, which was a great one. But um there was one this year I watched called Up, Upright, and the lead actor. I love how I wrote you have the down. list there. <laughs> the lead actor, it was Tim Minchin, and um, the final episode. If you guys, if your viewers want to watch a great episode of television, um, the, the final episode of Upright, which is a fairly new series, maybe a couple years old. I'm not sure. Uh, Tim mentioned, I, I'd love to meet him. He did a scene. His whole quest is to return this piano back to his brother's house, back to his mother's house. I think that his brother lives in, but he, he's estranged from his, it's very complicated, but he has a scene with a little girl, but beside the piano in the back of a pickup truck, who is his daughter, but the little girl thinks his brother is the father, is oh. her father. Yeah. He's actually the father. And he's telling her about the piano and where, and he's telling her about him and his heart. And I'm going to cry just, just thinking about it. If you get a chance to watch that uh, scene, it's some powerful stuff, man. I, I so... Pass off to Aussie uh, television shows and television writing. You're There's just making really me so are... much, so much prouder to be Aussie as well for everything you've been saying and and that you wanted to come on my show because I'm Aussie. So thank you. Yeah, well, I think a lot of it has to, has got to do with what I'm seeing coming out of that country, and why I wondered why don't I see? You know, often you'll see people from other countries if they have a show that's a hit. They're, then you'll see them on some American show mm. and they don't 
you know, necessarily have the same, their, their talents aren't being used the, the same way. You know, they're sort of supporting player on that show, American, new American show, and you go, hey, that's the guy or the girl from, so, but um, there is, um, the, the one actor that's from Love My Way is Ben Mendelsohn. Mm-hmm. And Ben Ben Mendelsohn has gone on to have quite a very successful Hollywood career. But I mention him because he is actually, uh, when I see him perform, he's sort of the Tim Fleming <laughs> character very often, only in the adult world, not not, not the world of Heartland, like a family show. Mm. He's he's what Tim would be if I was on a show that wasn't a family show yes. where he, he, he has you on the edge of your seat. Um, my wife and I watched him in bloodline, which is an American TV series. Mm. And he played Danny, the character that he played on that show. And every time he'd come on screen, my wife would sit up a little bit, like, like uncomfortable on the edge of, of, of the sofa. because <laughs> He was so effective. And I kind of feel in a way that, that Tim has that effect on people when, you know, on Heartland, they're like, uh-oh, here He's comes here. Tim. <laughs> yeah, what's, what is going to go, what, what shit is he going to stir up in this, uh, uh, in this scene, so. Well, that's awesome. Keep yeah. watching uh, some Australian shows. There is some really great ones. Uh, I got a time on my hands right now. I can catch up on all this. Exactly. Stuff. We've had the whole year of COVID. <laughs> Before we finish up today, I I did want to quickly talk about you directing and producing because that's something else you've been getting into on the side of acting and you've directed at least, what, about 20 episodes so far of Heartland. How was getting into that for you? Did you actually do like a course or did you kind of study it from all your years of acting and and learning from other directors? The latter. I, I started directing in the 90s when I was doing Silk Stockings, and I was given the opportunity by a iconic producer at the time named Stephen Cannell. And um, Stephen Cannell was the showrunner, writer, creator behind shows in the 90s and 80s, like 21 Jump Street and Wise Guy. And um, he was prolific. And But he also liked to act in some of his shows and I had just been cast uh, and hired to lead a a cop show called Silk Stockings that ran on the USA Network and he came on set to uh, perform a small role and there he was (laughs) and I was he he was a very nice guy but he said to me that one day he said uh, I hope you plan on directing some of these I, just like that, I said, well, uh, I'd love to, but I, he said, in, in more, fewer words, but he, he said, basically, I've been watching, I've been watching, you know, you can, I think you can do this job. Anyway, he championed it. He, he uh, was the one that really made it happen for me back then. So I, I started directing that show. And then when I came back up to Canada, I was on Queer as Folk for a year. And then I started on Wild Card, and Canada was different. It was just like, well, you can't do both. You know, you can act or direct, but nobody does both, and um, which was unfortunate. So when I was on Heartland, uh, I think it came down, and I mentioned it already. I needed a little more to do, and I was capable of doing both. So they allowed me to to start doing that, and I must say that that's when I feel most fully engaged when I'm doing both jobs on the show it's not that i have a favorite because they're two very different things um especially directing television it's really a time and money and it's a grinding grueling type of existence when you're prepping and filming a one hour television series but even though heartland looks like a pretty show with horses and children (laughs) those actually can be logistics that are very difficult to deal with because children have shorter hours Uh, we shoot in some remote places always uh, on location Mm. Um, and we have uh, animals involved as well which are exceptionally well behaved and actually not the problem is usually 
the difficulties we have with Heartland are weather and losing light, uh, constantly changing weather from the mountains. And mm. um, so it, it can really become, and we're on a very tight budget. So uh, I've never, ever been actually been on a production where somebody says, we have way more money than we need. So have at it. Go ahead. It's always, <laughs> it's always we have no money. We have 23 seconds to do this. So um, I, I think for me that the logistics part of it isn't, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for me to deal with. I, 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 and I can do both at the same time. Acting requires a whole different energy of calming yourself. Mm. And, uh, and directing is like doing a jigsaw puzzle all day, standing up outside and, and you're I, just in control under changing, all the time. Under cha- <laughs> right, right. So um, I enjoy it. I think that the, the cast tolerate me um, and the crew, you know, we get it. We get through it. Yeah. Uh, I'm proud. Of, I'm proud of the shows I've done. They, they do tend to throw a lot of the action, more action oriented shows at me for some reason. I made the mistake of, I guess, uh, proving I could do one way back when. And that, that's I get a lot of that. But, you know, there's action in every show that we have. So every director's got it's not it's not like there's one easier episode than another. But, um, yeah, it's it's essential to me actually existing on Heartland because um, I'm not the leading I'm not the lead guy I, I don't need they don't need me to act for 12 hours a day so yeah if I only have to act for a couple hours of the day there, there's a lot of downtime you know, well yeah might as well yeah might as well use me for something else so well you're doing a great um, job keep it up no well, and I Thank do, you. I do really want to ask too, because there is a scene in the new season of you destroying the house that Amy and Ty were starting to build. Was that really fun for you to, to actually act in? Well, um, no, <laughs> Bec- because you're in the moment. And... Yeah, you have to like act like you're being serious, and but I'm sure it would no, be really I, no, therapeutic. No, just it... <laughs> smashing the wood. Yeah. yeah. I get, I, yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, but no, I can find outlets for that kind of stuff outside of <laughs> my work. That I suppose the, the, the trick on that one was how, uh, you know, exactly how are we going to uh, disassemble the framing of that house with, with, you know, in a probably a 15 second montage. Yeah. So, so we had pre-rigged certain things and I had to hit things specifically and end up in certain spots. So it was all by design. And the magic of TV. Incredible. Yeah, but it, it was, a, I think, I think uh, that was a great episode. It was directed by uh, Pierre Tremblay, the first one. And um, uh, that, was a, that was a good moment, the way he had filmed that. Mm. One of the best scenes, I think. And you were in it. Good on you. <laughs> very, very heartfelt. Right. And that... yeah, you just kind of were really feeling the emotion in that one. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the whole season's been somewhat... I, I think it's been a good, strong season. Uh, and not too melodramatic. Mm. Um, it's been full of emotions. Happy, sad, angry. It's been everything. Well, I think... You might agree that they're real emotions. Yeah. Um, the last episode of, of Ty, Ty's jacket, um, and the motorcycle uh, was in the. You know, these are things that happen that people go through in real life. Yeah. All of us do. Uh, you know, what do I do with their clothes? Yeah, what, it was how great writing because I'm like, them? don't throw out the jacket. <laughs> you know, and uh, people can relate, and it's, I think that's what I'm finding interesting about the season is that it's touching on a lot of different experiences that the, the audience, the viewers have had in their own lives. And they, mm. and not they, just even this season, the whole show, I think. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. 
Like there's not not really I find any other show out there like it because it is so relatable and it's real things that we go through instead of just I think, know, making it I look think good Ant- and explosions and all that. <laughs> I think uh, I agree with you, and I think Amber uh, has been exceptional this year. Definitely. And which begs the question: the question is. You know, was the character of Ty holding certain things back? Mm. Oh, we're getting deep. Can't wait to see the well, next season. Where is it going to go? Well, <laughs> you know, I think I think you're right to think that. I think that this could be a it could it could be a strength, not a, not necessarily a weakness. But uh, mm. you know, all that all that said. Uh, Anybody out there that's an actor listening to me right now going, that guy just, you know, he just wants to keep his job. Well, yeah, sure, we all do. Um, you lose a character and, and, you know, and they're gone. And there, no other actor's going to say, well, if he's not here, I'm not going to do it. Um, it just doesn't happen because it's our it's our business. Yeah. We miss Graham, you know. Um, we, miss, we miss Graham. And he grew up on our set. And um, I completely understand that as a young man, uh, want, looking at his life and saying, I've spent, you know, half of my life on this film set, on this one show, that he might have questions. Mm-hmm. Is, there a, is there something else maybe I should look at? Maybe there's something missing. You know? You're talking to a person who didn't start in the business till my late 20s. So I'd already answered a lot of those questions along the way yeah. in my life and it already had a family uh, coming into it and you know so it's a different it, like the children that were on the show uh, Mallory um, Jessica Omley left left the show and she said to me when you Chris I've been on this show half my life and she was 19 at the time and I thought you're right kid you know get out there don't live it yep. I get it I, I get it you know so you miss you miss your your fellow actors and and the presence on and and you have the memories hmm. and you do and you forge ahead because yeah you want the job um, but shit happens <laughs> so you know I'm just ha- I'm just proud that everybody really uh, somehow it was an odd year to go almost a year before we filmed that show again we when we said goodbye on season 14 or season 13 it was over a year before we saw each other again wow because of the pandemic yeah and we we knew we were going to do another season we just didn't know when so we wrapped in august we the next august this past year uh we still hadn't started filming and we didn't start until september and now we had to squeeze all of those 10 shows in between september and december that were scripts that were really written for a summer, the summer months. Yeah. And as as we got into the season in September to December in Alberta, the sun starts to go down at six o'clock. By by six, we're oh. losing the light in the afternoon, and snow's coming, and the temperatures are dropping, and we have to play baseball outside. <laughs> right. That yeah. show was written for the summer. Yeah. We shot it. There was snow on the ground when you saw it. Like, it, it was, we we had a lot of challenges this year um, getting those 10 shows done. And the fact that they've turned out as well as they have and they're being received the way they are is, is just proof that you can, you know, collectively, if you if you all try and just make you it work, get, you can make it work. Mm. And also not to take it too seriously because... <laughs> You got to be able to dance. Exactly. Scramble and entertain people. <laughs> so if we're going to have a baseball game in the snow, let's, let's do, go it. do it. Let's do it. Can we get some of the snow off the field? So we did. This was amazing. So, Chris, I think it's time for the two minute hot seat. It's a famous game here on Rave It Up. And I'm just going to ask you questions, and you just have to pick your preference. So it's like dogs or cats, single dancing. 
and you have to answer as many questions in two minutes as possible. And then I'll see where you sit on the leaderboard up against everyone else that's been on the show. And if you want to beat Graham, because he played it two weeks ago, he answered 51 questions and is sitting number 37 on the leaderboard. So let's see if you can beat him today. <laughs> can I buy um, time? Oh, well, because it's a Zoom interview and there's a bit of delay, I'll give you like two minutes, 15. How's that sound? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you 50 bucks right now for an extra three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so you can answer them all. <laughs> all right. Are you ready? So It's lots of fun. <laughs> it's going to go very quickly. <laughs> I, I wasn't really listening, but I, you're going to ask me questions. I'm going to pick one of them. Yes. Just pick whatever you, what, whichever one you prefer. Okay, let's try right. it. Yeah, let's try it. The fans are going to love this because they'll learn some new stuff about you. <laughs> no pressure. All right, here we go, Chris. Three, two, one. iPhone or Samsung? Samsung. Apple or Android? Apple. Rap or rock? Rock. Rock or pop? Rock. Pop or country? Rock. Beach or mountains? Did you say pop or country? Beach or mountains? Rock or country? Yeah, pop or country. <laughs> oh, I'll take I'll take country. Um, uh, beach or mountain? Uh, beach. Beach or pool? Pool. Sun or rain? Sun. Skiing or snowboarding? I didn't hear the first question. Skiing or you snowboarding? Oh, pool. That boarding. Comedy or action? Comedy. Blondes or brunettes? Uh, both. Sweet or salty? Uh, I mean... <laughs> what? Sweet? Sweet or salty? Sweet. Sunglasses or hat? Sunglasses. SUV or convertible? SUV. Mac or PC? Mac. PlayStation or Wii? I... Th I one broke up. I'll just say PlayStation. <laughs> Clean or messy? Clean. Uh, dogs or cats? Dogs. Singing or dancing? Ooh, singing. Italian or Chinese food? Italian. Summer or winter? Summer. Johnny Depp or Will Smith? Uh, Will. Mall or online shopping? Mall. Cinema or home movie? Cinema. Ice cream or gelato? Gelato. Cake or cookies? Cake. Cookies or cookie dough? Cookies. Family or friends? Family. Football or soccer? Football. <laughs> Christmas or your birthday? Christmas. Night or day? Night. Bus or train? What? Bus or train? Bus. Straight or curly hair? Straight. Eye color blue or brown? Blue. Oh, and we're out of time. <laughs> Just gave you a little bit extra there because we broke up a couple of times. How many questions do you think you answered in that time? 30. 30. Oh, that's exactly how many you answered. How did you guess that? I was <laughs> counting, you counting as, we as you were going. <laughs> That's crazy. So you didn't beat Graham, but there is a lot of delay compared to what I had with Graham too, surprisingly. So you are sitting uh, number 56 on the Rev It Up leaderboard at the moment. So we're just going to have to get you here in Australia and replay it face to face. <laughs> <laughs> that is a plan. That's the future. I love it. And we are unfortunately getting to the end of the interview, Chris. But as a closing statement, and was probably the most important question, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your 14 year old self? It's all gonna be okay. Mm, so simple, I love it. Good for all the young listeners, I think actually. It's all gonna be okay. Don't stress about the little things. <laughs> I suppose that, and you're right where you wanna be. Mm. Thank you for that. And thank you so much okay. for coming on our show today. I really appreciate your, oh, well, a lot of your time. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. 
but you're welcome on the show anytime. So if you want to come back on in the future, you just let me know. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well, I hope you all enjoyed today's interview. If you like, check out any of our other interviews, like the other interviews we've done with some of the other Heartland cast, visit our website, raveituptv.com. And make sure to check out our podcast on all podcasting platforms and tell your friends. If you haven't already gotten our book as well, Knowing What I Know Now, that is also on our website, raveituptv.com, available worldwide in paperback and ebook. There's even an audiobook coming very soon. But for now, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.